Today, we are going to look at the whales in the family Balanopteridae, more commonly known as the Rorquals. Some of these are the largest animals to have ever lived and are truly the giants of the ocean. My last video covered the evolution of the whales, as well as the other baleen whales, so check that video out if you haven't already. For those interested, there is a document in the description with notable research papers I used for this video, along with the details of the sources for the images used. To briefly cover the phylogeny of whales, they are most closely related to artiodactyls, like the pigs, cows and deer, but their closest relatives are the hippopotamus. Whales are in the suborder Cetacea. There are two parv orders of whales. Odontocetae contains the toothed whales, including the dolphins and porpoises. Rorquals are in the other parv order, Mysticetae, or the baleen whales. These whales are easily distinguished from the toothed whales by their feeding strategy. They use large plates of bristle-like baleen to filter krill, plankton, small fish and other animals out of the water. The least related family in Mr. Sita is Balanidae, containing the right and bowhead whales. The next family is slightly controversial, either being Cetotheridae or Neobalanidae. Whichever family it is assigned to, it only has one living species, the pygmy right whale. This is the closest living relative to the Rorquals. But for more information on these animals, check out my previous video. This brings us to the subject of this video, the family Balanopteridae, or the Rorquals. Rorqual is derived from Old Norse, roughly meaning furrow whale. It refers to their most characteristic feature, the longitudinal folds of skin along their throat and chest. The Rorquals are by far the largest family of baleen whales, with a total of 11 species. Despite this, we are going to cover some of the whales here very quickly, as very little is known about them. This is mostly because many of the species in this family were poorly understood before their genetics could be studied. So many of these species, which are now known to be different, were once considered a single species. The first clade of the Rorquals contains the minke whales. Starting with the common minke whale, Balanoptera acuterostris, it is the smallest Rorqual, and second smallest baleen whale, only behind the pygmy right whale. They can reach lengths of up to 9 metres or 30 feet. It is sometimes called the northern minke to distinguish it from its Antarctic cousin, but this is misleading as there is a southern subspecies of the common minke. This subspecies is known as the dwarf minke, as this name suggests. It is smaller than the northern ones and is also distinguished by a white band on its flippers. These two subspecies together have an almost global distribution, only being absent from a thin band of water around the equator. The common minke whale is considered least concern, but there is not a global estimate of their population. The population in the North Atlantic has been less studied than that in the North Pacific, and the southern dwarf minkeys have not been surveyed at all, as they were historically assumed to be Antarctic minkeys. The highly dubious number of 200,000 individuals has been put forward, but this number is very tentative and likely to change if a comprehensive survey of common minke populations is carried out. One interesting phenomenon that has been noted in this species is sexual segregation, with males and females in certain areas having a much higher ratio than would be expected from chance. For example, Lydra et al. in 2009 found that 71 to 78% of common minke whales off the western coast of Greenland were female. Males, on the other hand, dominated the eastern coast. The reason for this difference is unknown, although it is not to do with the birth ratio of males to females. That is roughly 1 to 1 in the same areas. Lydra et al. suggested that sea temperature indirectly plays a pivotal role in this, with females preferring the cooler temperatures. I say indirectly because it likely affects something that the different genders prefer, which then causes the observed gender imbalances. The other minke whale is the Antarctic minke, Balanoptera bonarensis. They are slightly larger than the common minke, but are still the second smallest rorqual, at less than 10 metres or 33 feet long. It is more threatened than the common minke, being classed as near threatened by the IUCN. This is a fairly recent change, as before 2018 it was classed as data deficient, due to the lack of information about its populations. This is not helped by its preferred habitat of pack ice around Antarctica, which is almost impossible to survey with any accuracy. They are not only found near Antarctica, however, and have been found as far north as Brazil, South Africa and Australia. A few have even been found north of the equator. 
It is suggested that the species migrates, as single tagged individuals have been recorded travelling very long distances. One whale was tagged near the main landmass of Antarctica and was found several years later off the coast of Brazil. However, little is known about this migration and it is still largely speculation. They are also one of the whale species most affected by climate change. Since they largely rely on the pack ice around Antarctica, if this melts then they could be in trouble. Of course, they are already found away from pack ice at least some of the year, but with it melting they would be brought into direct competition for their preferred prey, Antarctic krill, with humpback whales, seals and penguins and other birds. Right now it coexists with these other species, and especially humpback whales, by specialising on feeding under ice packs. Humpbacks prefer feeding in the open water, so if the pack ice melts, then these two species will likely be brought into direct competition. The next species in the phylogeny is the grey whale, Ascriptius robustus. It is much larger than either of the minke whales, reaching lengths of 15 metres or 49 feet. It was traditionally considered the sole member of its genus, but the extinct Akashima whale was placed into the same genus in 2017. The grey whale is still the only living member of this genus, however. There are two distinct populations of grey whales, one in the northeast Pacific Ocean along the North American coast, and a rarer one in the northwest Pacific along the Asian coast. This whale was extirpated from the Atlantic Ocean during the 17th or 18th century, probably due to whaling, but in the 2010s there have been a few sightings in this ocean so the whale may slowly be returning. Grey whales have a unique feeding strategy, even among the baleen whales. It mainly feeds on crustaceans on the seafloor. It does this by diving down, rolling onto its side, and scooping up seafloor sediment in its mouth. It then swims off, using its baleen to sieve out the water and sand, leaving the crustaceans behind for it to eat. This makes it the baleen whale most reliant on shallower waters. Despite this being its preference, it is an opportunistic feeder and will switch to feeding on plankton in the water column when benthic crustaceans are scarcer. Grey whales have highly complex breeding behaviours. Females are highly synchronised, going into estrus in late November to early December. This synchronisation is important as it coincides with their annual migration so the females can give birth in warmer waters. It is common for females to have several mates during a single breeding season. Gestation takes around 13 and a half months and females give birth once every three or four years. While most people would realise that a migrating whale is not the best animal to try and keep in captivity, it has been attempted several times. These attempts never lasted long, either due to health problems or the whale getting too large for the facilities. You would think that people would realise that whales get big, but apparently not. The main reason that I'm mentioning these attempts at captivity is that the largest animal ever kept in captivity was a grey whale. It was named JJ and was released when it was 9.4 metres or 31 feet as it was getting too big for its enclosure. The humpback whale, Megaptera novae anglii, is larger again at around 18 metres or 60 feet. It is perhaps one of the best known of all whale species. It is the only species in its genus and has a distinctive body shape from which its common name is derived. It also has very long flippers, for which its genus was named. Megaptera literally means large wing. It is popular with whale watchers, as it is known for their spectacular behaviours when surfing. For example, they frequently breach, which is when they lift two-thirds or more of their body out of the water and splash down on their back. They will also slap the surface of the water with their flippers and tail. There are a few behavioural things I want to focus on with the humpback. The first is their song, well not the only species we will look at to perform the vocalisations that are commonly known as whale song, the humpback males are noticeable for the duration and complexity of their songs. They often perform these songs during the breeding season so it is believed to play a part in competing for mates. Despite referring to them as songs, it is extremely different from sounds produced by other mammals including human singing. It is still unknown how the whales produce the sound. It appears to originate in their larynx, but they lack vocal cords, so the exact mechanism is unknown. While there are many variations of their song, here are a couple of short snippets to give you an idea of what they sound like.
Humpbacks also use a form of whale song for feeding, which is a social event and brings us to the second behaviour I want to discuss. This is bubble net feeding, a form of feeding that seems to be unique to humpback whales and a couple of other rock calls that we have not yet discussed. It is a cooperative form of feeding that can have up to 20 whales participating. They will entrap a school of fish or krill by creating bubbles from their blowholes to act as a net. One whale will then sound a feeding call and all whales will rise vertically through the water with their mouths open to catch the trapped prey. The size of this bubble net can be up to 30 metres or 98 feet in diameter. It is a learned behaviour and so not all humpback populations know how to do it. While bubble net feeding is only done in groups, there is a similar behaviour known as lunge feeding that can be done by a single whale. Note that these are not the only ways humpbacks will feed, but it is interesting to look at a cooperative feeding method, not something typically associated with baleen whales. While found worldwide, humpback whales are migratory. They feed in the cooler seas at either pole, and then will migrate to the warmer equatorial seas to mate and give birth. Because of this, they only eat for half of each year. They will feed constantly when at their feeding grounds, sometimes for up to 22 hours a day. It is likely also why some of them have developed feeding methods such as bubble net feeding. It is an efficient way to feed more individuals at the same time. This intense feeding effort is to put on enough fat to survive their months at the breeding ground, where they will not eat at all. They are considered less concerned by the IUCN. Like most whales, they were majorly impacted by the hunting during the 18th and 19th centuries, but their numbers have bounced back since whaling was outlawed. One of the more popular hypotheses for the origin of bubble net feeding is that it was developed in response to the pressure of whalers. It allowed them to eat quickly at the surface and then retreat deeper underwater to avoid whalers. The truth of this is impossible to quantify, but it is interesting speculation. The closest living relative to humpback whales is the fin whale, Balaenoptera physalis. It is the second longest animal on earth, only after the blue whale. Their largest confirmed length is around 26 metres or 85 feet, but there are reports of longer individuals sighted. Their body is long and slender, with a grey back and a paler underside. They are sometimes compared to greyhounds, as this lean, streamlined appearance means that they can swim very quickly when needed, reaching speeds of 47 kilometres per hour or 29 miles per hour in short bursts. That is impressive for the second largest animal in the world. Greyhounds themselves can get up to 60 km per hour when sprinting, but they are nowhere near the largest breed of dog. Fin whales are found worldwide, only being excluded from the far northern seas where pack ice makes it impossible for them to survive. Like humpback whales, they make vocalisations, but these are nowhere near as complex. They are known for being the lowest frequency of any animal, tied with the blue whale. The first US biologists to notice the sound of the fin whale did not believe that they were made by any animal and so investigated equipment malfunctions, geothermal activity and even checked for Soviet submarines to try and determine the source of the noise. Listening to it, I can certainly see why they came to these conclusions as it does sound a little like the hum of a motor. Here is a quick snippet of their call to give you some idea. Fin whales are listed as vulnerable by the IUCN. This is actually an improvement, as it appears that their population is increasing. They were listed as endangered from 1996 until 2018, when they had their threat category reduced. The justification for this is that, like most whales, commercial whaling was the main cause of its decline. Since that practice is now commonly illegal, the population has started to recover. It is worth noting that the global population is impossible to estimate, as little is known about the population size of the fin whales in the southern hemisphere. Moving on to the largest animal in the world, the blue whale, Balaenoptera musculus, can reach lengths of 30 metres or 98 feet. This means that they may be the largest animal to have ever lived, although a fossilised whale species, Perucetus, was first described in 2023 and may have been even bigger. Perucetus is still a very recent find, and the fragmentary nature of its remains makes its size a little ambiguous, so its overall size is disputed and may change as more about it is discovered. This means that the blue whale can retain its impressive title at least for now. The blue whale is considered endangered, after having been hunted almost to the point of extinction by whalers during the 19th century. Some estimates put it as high as 97% of individuals being killed during this time. Its population is now believed to be increasing, but it will take many years to recover from this near extinction.
It has a U-shaped head and a tiny dorsal fin located near its tail. It has two blowholes which can spray 9 to 12 meters or 30 to 40 feet into the air. The skin is a mottled grey colour which can appear blue when it is underwater, leading to its common name. Blue whales are typically solitary but can be found in larger groups when there is enough food. Like the humpback whales, they feed in the cooler waters near the poles and then migrate to their breeding grounds near the equator. Unlike humpbacks, they are not as popular with whale watchers as their massive size makes them unable to breach. Blue whales have a very similar song to fin whales, sounding like a series of clicks. Man-made noise may be impacting blue whales' vocalisations, as they seem to call less often when near a sonar device, which was also found to interrupt whales feeding deep in the ocean. The last branch I have on this part of the phylogeny is for the Bride's Whale Species Complex. This is where we will be going through these species much faster. A species complex is where the species look so similar that the distinction between different species is often unclear. In the case of the Bride's Whale Complex, they were considered two or three species only five years ago. Now there are five confirmed species, largely thanks to genetic analysis. The first species in this complex is the Psy Whale, Balanoptera borealis. Psy comes from the Norwegian word for pollock, a species of fish. This is the third largest whale after the blue and fin whales. It is classified as endangered by the IUCN, but they believe that its population is increasing and that it will meet the criteria to be downgraded to vulnerable in the next few years. The reason for its threat category is the effects of historic whaling, as it is with many of the species we have looked at today. Psy whales are found worldwide, but prefer the open oceans who will avoid getting too near the coastlines, which can even be seen on their distribution map. They look similar to other large rorquals, and especially the smaller bride's whale that we will be looking at soon. They can be found alone, but will travel in small pods of up to six whales. It is fast for a whale, being slightly faster than the fin whale we looked at earlier, reaching speeds of up to 50 km per hour or 31 miles per hour over short distances. Despite this, it does not dive deeply, and when it comes to the surface, prefers to stay just beneath the surface of the water. Unlike closely related whales, such as Bride's Whale, it does not breach or lift its tail out of the water. The next species, Eden's Whale, Balanoptera edeni, is incredibly hard to talk about, as many sources list it interchangeably with Bride's Whale. It used to be a subspecies of Bride's Whale, but has since been elevated to its own species. Eden's Whale is smaller, and it might be restricted to the Indo-Pacific region. The distribution I'm showing is a combined one for the Brides and Eden's whales, as I could not find a separate one for the two species, but this would suggest it is in the areas around the Pacific Islands, Australia, Southeast Asia and the eastern coast of Africa. Interestingly, this whale was not directly targeted by whalers, but became a target in the 1970s as other species had been depleted. This was near the end of commercial whaling however, so the population was not as affected as many of the other rorquals. The IUCN still lists Edens and Brides whales as a single species, and it caused them least concern. It is unknown if this rating would hold true if they separated them into different species, but it is possible that Edens whale would end up data deficient if this was done, due to the taxonomic confusion that I hope I am making clear. It is hard to estimate a population size or trend when it is unclear which whales are included in that species and which are excluded. Despite the confusion between Eden's and Bride's whales, another species is more closely related to Eden's whale. This is Rice's whale, Balanoptera ricei. Again, it was originally believed to be a subpopulation of Bride's whale, but was identified as its own species in 2021. It is critically endangered with less than 50 mature whales identified. It is only found in the Gulf of Mexico, and its population is believed to be declining. It is one of the rarest cetaceans in the world, along with the tiny vaquita in the Gulf of California on the other side of North America. The most notable difference between Rice's whale and the other whales in the species complex is its feeding behaviour. Most of them feed on pelagic fish near the surface of the water, but this has never been seen in Rice's whale. Instead, it spends its days diving deep into the water, only remaining near the surface at night. As such, it feeds at or near the seafloor. It is unclear exactly what its prey is, but it is speculated to include lanternfish and hatchetfish, as they are common at that depth. Threats to rice as well includes oil spills, plastic, entanglements with fishing nets, collisions with vessels, and seismic surveys for gas or oil. 
Given the few remaining individuals, these threats are significant, as even a single death from any of these sources drastically reduces the population's likelihood to recover. The next species is Omura's whale, which was formally identified in 2003. Very little is known about it, and its IUCN rating is currently listed as data deficient. Before it became a full species, it was considered a dwarf or pygmy variant of Bride's whale. Most of its strandings and sightings are in the waters offshore from southeast and eastern Asia and northern Australia. However, its true range is likely much larger than this, as it has been recorded off the coast of Madagascar, Egypt, Iran, Mauritania and Brazil, which would make it quite widespread. These random sightings are demonstrated by this distribution map, which is why it seems so patchy. Amura's whale is one of the smallest baleen whales, only larger than the two species of minke whale. They can reach lengths of around 11.5 metres or 37.7 feet. As I said, little else seems to be known about the species, so let's move on to the last one. I have already mentioned Bride's whale, Balenoptera bridei, several times, as it is the original species in this complex. This does make it somewhat problematic to describe, as much of the historic research into it may have been on one of the closely related species, like Eden's or Amura's whales. So, some generalizations would include that it typically feeds on fish and krill near the surface of the water. As mentioned when talking about Rice's whale, this is the typical behaviour of these species. It is classified as least concerned by the IUCN, but as I said earlier, this seems to include Eden's whale in the single classification, so it may change if the species are separated. They are found in tropical and subtropical waters, and unlike Eden's whale do seem to be found in all oceans in this region, the Atlantic, Pacific and Indian. It is suggested that the global population could be as high as 100,000, which is slightly refreshing after learning about Rice's whale. Around two-thirds of these are estimated to be in the Northern Hemisphere. Bride's whale does have one distinction. It is one of the few recorded incidences where a whale has attempted to swallow a human. A diver was photographing fish off the coast of South Africa when a bride's whale appeared below him and swallowed the fish, accidentally including him along with them. Humans are too large to actually be swallowed, since baleen whales have to eat their prey whole. So after a few seconds, the whale surfaced and released a diver, who was unharmed. He was lucky, as if the whale had dived, he would have drowned. This incident is interesting, but was accidental and is not a common occurrence, with this being the only verified example I could find when I attempted to research the topic. We have now covered all 11 species of currently known rorquals. Hopefully, another revision of the genetics here does not result in more species being added in the future, but it is always a possibility. All of them may share a unique and distinctive filter feeding device known as baleen, but I hope it is now apparent the diversity still found among these incredible animals, with different ways of using their baleen, different amounts of cooperation between individuals, different preferred foods and habitats and lifestyles, there is a lot to cover here and I hope that I have done it justice. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for listening and feel free to suggest another group of animals you want to see me cover in the comments.